Hey, we've been in a series about the family. We went through Ephesians and Colossians talking about the family, and we're going to wrap up today, and we're going to discuss love, of course, because it's close to Valentine's Day and everything. I remember when I was, when I was a, a wee lad way back, you know, in the days when you could still ride a bicycle without having a full body cast on and go down the road and jump ramps and, you know, take skin out of your chin when you didn't land it right. All those good days, right? Nowadays, kids can't. They can't even ride one of those little stupid scooters without wrist braces and knee pads. And How are you going to learn that falling down hurts if you're padded? It doesn't work, does it? You know who needs the pads is the old people, right? As we get older, we fall and we break everything. It just seems to happen that way. And just don't take chances, right? Even coming down off a step letter now, I want to reach instead of just jump off those last two. All right, you want to be careful because I might twist something or break something. But anyway, back when I was a kid, back in the good old days, right, we used to have Valentine's Day celebrations at school. Remember that? It was awesome, right? You would get to make your own little Valentine's box, right? Find some wrapping paper or some, you know, the old paper sacks. I guess you couldn't do it with plastic sacks. That wouldn't look very... But, you know, we decorate it, put it out there, right? And, and throughout that whole week of school till our party, everyone can come by and put in those Valentines, right? You'd have the Snoopies and the Garfields, right? Some of you don't know, but there was this guy called Ziggy. Remember the Ziggy? Yeah. Yeah, some of you have to Google it. What is a Ziggy? Huh? Yeah, you look it up. All right? I mean, all of those great Scooby-Doo, the Jetsons, we're talking classic. If you were real cool and you had nice parents, they'd let you get the Dukes of Hazard ones. Remember those? Yeah, except for Daisy. You couldn't take that. I went to a private Christian school. They wouldn't let you use the Daisy Duke one. That one didn't get in there. I'm just saying. So anyway, but man, Valentine's Day was great. And, and you know, the Valentine's cards, you could always tell. You know, sometimes the parents would just tape the, the little piece of candy on there, right? But the ones that the parents had a little bit more money and they were envelopes, right? And you could see, man, that envelope was thick. There's going to be a lot of candy or there's going to be something good in there, right? You just knew it was going to be good. And you'd open it up and it would be one of those stupid paper mache things that rolled out into a heart. I mean, you got your candy. Yes, good candy. No, you turn it out. Oh, it's a nice little heart. Yeah. When it comes to love, we sometimes get our expectations set high or set low sometimes based on what we perceive, don't we? And sometimes, if we're honest, those, those expectations are set because of our life experience. Life experience told me, thick envelope, I got a Snickers bar or something in there. All right? But little did I know that some mom thought it would be cute to buy a little Valentine's that rolls out and you could put on your wall. I got news for Mrs. Pedersen, it didn't go on my wall. We're going to talk about love. We've been talking about family, so we're going to cover some things that I didn't want to cover. I wanted to hold it for Valentine's Day. But let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. It says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, when we set our little grace, grow, go as a church, and we met, that was when... Uh, Lance was here, and Brian was the only elder at the time. And, you know, everyone wants to put love into their church slogan because God is love. God tells us to love one another. But, but the reason, and honestly, I was probably the one fighting the hardest on it, the reason I didn't want love in any slogan is because the word love has been twisted. And, and, and when the Bible says God is love, God is perfect love. God loves unconditionally, he loves ex exponentially, but the same God that loves exponentially and, and created heaven for us, put Adam and Eve in a perfect garden and we messed it up, that same God of love that's made amazing things for us also says that if you sin, there's going to be a punishment. And see, our world wants to take the punishment away from love. And if you're going to love perfectly, guys, there's got to be boundaries in that love. See, God is love. He reflects and shows us perfect love. Because we live in a fallen world, our view of love 
has been skewed. Jesus tells his disciples in John chapter 13 that we, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, we have to love. Here's what he says in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We are commanded to love. Notice what Jesus says. The way that I loved you is how you are to love each other. If you read the Gospels, you have the account of Jesus Christ when he walked on this earth. I, some people think of Jesus as this guy, you know, in his amazing robes because guys drew pictures, right? And because there were no Polaroids or iPhones back then, right? So whoever drew this picture of Jesus often portrayed that image in their image, right? Pale skin, a nice white robe and everything else kind of comes in their image. But guys, Jesus was a Jew. He came of the Jewish race. He probably had darker olive skin, may not have been very tall. The Bible tells us if you looked at him, there wasn't anything that goes, hey, there is the Son of God. There is the King of the Jews. He blended in great. But think about who Jesus chose to hang out with. He hung out with fishermen, outcasts, tax collectors. Those of you that like to fish or go on fishing trips with other guys, how are those fishing trips? Let us now grabbeth our worm and baiteth our hook. Amen. Watch me casteth, yea, verily, Philip. That was a good one, dear brother John. No, they're cracking up, right? Ha <laughs> you snagged that rim over there. You can't cast for nothing. Watch this, right? They were men hanging out, doing men's stuff. Jesus lived like us. The love that he showed toward his disciples was encouraging. It was true caring. Through his ministry, he provided for them, right? Just before he sends them out, they go out fishing. They catch nothing. Jesus says, throw your nets on the other side. And they pull in this big old huge haul. Do you understand that haul would have provided for their families while they follow Jesus and travel the countryside? That's love. But that same kind of love where Jesus provides for them and they kid around, Jesus looks at what many people think is his closest friend, Peter, and he looks Peter in the eye and says, get behind me, Satan. See, there's a love with boundaries. If we're going to love like Jesus, if we're going to reflect his kind of love, kind of like last week, the main points for husbands and wives, for men and women, guys, we need to be in his word and we need to understand truly what love is because if you go to this world, and you get their definition of love, first of all, it's going to be all over the place, right? It's going to be about new cars. It, it's going to be about how many thumbs up did you give my comment on Facebook or the Twitter or whatever it is. Their definition of love moves from place to place, and Satan likes it that way. Because if Satan can redefine it, then he can either make you depressed or he can put you on a cloud that you shouldn't be on the cloud of. See, the Bible is full packed of truth. We need to base it on truth. God reflects love through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God's reflection of how it should be here on earth. He walked among us. He laughed. He cried. He wept. He corrected. He rebuked. Well, Jesus was a man, not of war. Oh, really? I read a passage where Jesus flipped over tables, fashioned a whip, and ran guys out of there. Uh, next time that, that you think you're feeling that you're man enough, I want you to fashion a whip and I want you to go into one of these stores and try and drive everyone out and see what happens to you. Even in Jesus' day, he knew what was right and he took care of business. See, all of that of how Jesus lived is a proper reflection of love. We've been talking about the marriage relationship and I've skipped over this for a little bit. So parents, if you're going to have little conversations over the supper table tonight, I apologize. I'm not going to, I'm going to keep it where it needs to be. But part of love, guys, is there is also this physical kind of love that the world is twisted as well. And even in churches, when we fail to talk about it, we are leaving it to the kids on the school bus, we're leaving it to the world to educate our kids on what this physical attraction that God said is good is. 
Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the church writes to Paul and says, hey, we're having some issues as far as the mommy and daddy type of relationship. We need some clarification. So Paul writes back, and he says this in 1 Corinthians 7, now concerning the matter of which you wrote, it's almost like he doesn't even want to talk about it. Concerning that matter, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Hold on before you go off the deep end, he's going to qualify. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. Guys, there is no family without this intimacy, without this relationship between husband and wife. Okay, The whole, the whole point is, I know because of sin, now there is barrenness, but the whole point that God made Adam and Eve was to take over the earth and rule over it. So there needs to be this physical intimacy. Yes, God made it pleasurable. Otherwise, there probably wouldn't be kids running around, right? Well, we kind of talked about it in Bible study Wednesday night. At that point where that mother gives birth to that child, those minutes leading up to it, her husband is the devil and they will never have physical intimacy again. Right? But then God helps your mind to forget and because he put in us this attraction for each other, because we're supposed to be in relationship, all of a sudden those things go by the wayside and here we go again, right? Here comes kid number two. I'm never, kid number 14, I'm never, Right? But notice, in the marriage, it is supposed to be for each other, and there shouldn't be a denying. I want you to notice that he tells the men first, don't you be denying your wife. And some of your wives are going, I've never known a man. That went, there were. There are. But the point is, we are not to penalize each other in our relationship because we are not getting our way by holding this back. It is reserved for the marriage relationship. That's why he said you need to get married. Because the desire there is great. As a youth pastor, parents are like, Pastor, my, my kids are having trouble. They're getting promiscuous. They want to see pornography and all of that stuff. And I tried to gently remind parents that that system kicks in at the age of 12 to 13, does it not? Oftentimes in the Jewish life they would marry their kids off at those young ages at what age are we telling our kids to get married now my daughter is free to marry anyone she wants at 35 guys we try and push them off of this stuff and then wonder why why they're struggling with purity why they keep giving their hearts away and their heart gets broke and sometimes their heart is so broke when they do find someone, they have trust issues in their relationships. Our, our modern society sometimes has hurt our, our marriage relationships. Let's go on in the rest of that passage. Verse 4, 1 Corinthians 7, he says, For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Guys, this does not mean that we get to abuse each other uh, physically or emotionally. This means that we are to live in mutual submission and love. That's what it means. Do not deprive each other except perhaps for an agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Our world tells you that love does not have anything to do with that physical intimacy. It's just an urge you have that has to be taken care of. Do you know who has urges that acts on them quickly without thinking about it and they have to get taken care of? Animals. Animals. Guys, we are not animals. We are created by God. He put his hands to form man. He breathed into his life, gave us his image. We are a special created being. When we act that way, we are stooping to Satan's level, and Satan's going, hey, God, see? See? They're, they're just like me. They want their own way. All that effort you put into them, 
they're still rejecting you. In a family, guys, there has to be this between a husband and wife. When a husband and wife are are in proper relationship with each other and with God, it is an amazing thing. I I hope and pray that we don't shortchange ourselves by stepping outside of those boundaries and carrying around that baggage that often comes through bad relationships and bad choices. One final thing about love in a family I want to cover, and I want to talk about forgiveness. Unforgiveness is not always a visual thing that we see, but at any wrong relationship inside the family, you will find that bitter root of unforgiveness has taken root in someone's heart, and it has destroyed the family unit. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Notice this next line, as God in Christ forgive you. In the prayer that he taught us to pray, right? Forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed or wronged us. <coughs> Some of us don't realize that the reason that we are not feeling the closeness in the relationship with God is because we are the ones harboring forgiveness, unforgiveness, excuse me. We are the ones that are holding on. Someone has done us wrong. And we're going to try and make it right. When we don't forgive, when we don't move on, all of a sudden, fear starts grabbing a hold of our hearts. And fear is the opposite of love. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. If if I am holding something someone's done against me, I'm going to be concerned that I'm going to get hurt again. And if I'm going to be so concerned that I'm going to get hurt again, that's going to keep me from entering into relationships the proper way. Or... I'm going to have to have control of those relationships. I've got to have the say. You know, I've got to know what's going on. You need to do what I ask when I ask. Guys, that's not love. 1 Corinthians 13 gives us an exhaustive list of what love is. Love is. I'm sure you've heard it at weddings or you've read it or usually hear it around Valentine's Day. But when we have unforgiveness, we twist what that love is. If we're unforgiving, We have a list of debts that we need to pay back to people, correct? You know, they said this about me. Just wait. When the time is right, it's going to come out. List. That's part of unforgiveness, guys. That, That list just grows in our heart. There's more checks over here than pluses over here. That's not what love is. It all comes down, honestly, to pride. I know best. You, you now, we now put ourselves at the center instead of putting God at the center of our lives. We now say that I am the judge of how bad their sin is versus God is the judge, and God offers me forgiveness. I need to offer forgiveness to them. Unforgiveness, pride, is the ultimate thing that brought Jesus down from glory and put him on the cross. Because Adam and Eve in the garden decided to listen to Satan when he said, hey, that fruit, doesn't it look good? I'll bet it tastes good. Even though they had an entire garden of fruit, one stinking tree out of all of those. But they started reasoning in their mind. Hey, you know what? Satan whispers in Eve's ear, what about that tree? Yeah, what about that tree? Man, that fruit looks good. You're right, that that fruit does. Why would God give you all these other great trees with great fruit and not let you eat of that one tree. He must be hiding something from you. He doesn't want you to know something good. He knows that if you take of that, you will now be like him. See, oftentimes we try and tell our kids, don't let someone talk you into something that you're not supposed to do. But as adults, we don't take our own admonishment, do we? Well, I'm an adult, it's different. And we start reasoning away our sin. Back to what Jesus told his disciples. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Notice the last verse there, verse 35. By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
The way we live our lives tells the story if we follow Christ or not. I don't care how many bracelets you have, how many cross tattoos, whatever it is you got going on, if your life is not marked by loving one another, not keeping accounts of wrong, by giving to people even though they don't deserve it, by forgiving people when they've wronged you, if our lives aren't marked with love, then we're not following the Christ of the Bible. So what is love? Well, John says... Love was a baby born in a manger. John says that he grew in the same manner as we grew. That he was in favor with God and man. He lived this perfect life. And he was murdered because of the sins of people that weren't even born yet and the sins of people that lived up until that time. He didn't cry out foul. He didn't say, this isn't fair. I want a new attorney. He understood that the penalty for man's sin was that a perfect man had to die on the cross. When no one else could be found, when no one else could live up to it, Jesus says, here I am, send me, I'll go. And as they put Jesus on the cross, his heavenly Father knew that Jesus showed love, lived love, lived a perfect life, And he couldn't watch as his son breathed his final, as all of my sin, all of your sin was heaped on him at the cross. You know what else is love? There were women there. The time was getting late. Remember, it's Passover. That's why I had had that communion before. He went to the garden to pray. The women couldn't take care of his body. They wrapped him quickly in those swaddling clothes. Well, it doesn't say swaddling clothes are grave clothes. The same clothes he started with, guys, is the same clothes he ended life with. They wrapped him quickly, put him in a tomb, and those women went back there. We're going to take care of Jesus, right? We loved him so much. We're going to put all of the oils and take care of his body the way it should be. And they go to the tomb, and love says, he is not here, he is risen. See, love is that whole story. It's the life. It is a father giving up his son. It is Jesus submitting to his father and submitting to men and living a perfect life. And it is Jesus dying sacrificially, but more importantly, he rose victoriously so we can have life eternal. Guys, that is love. That should be the best thing that's ever entered into your life. Better than a sham wow. Better than whatever thing Ron Propel is now pushing. Spray on hair, whatever he's pushing. But how many of us will tell our partners or our friends about the latest fishing thing or the latest hunting thing or the latest Tupperware or the latest Longer Burger basket, whatever it is, but you guys won't tell them about Jesus Christ and the love he gave us. Hey, make it a point this week. Don't just demonstrate love. Let's tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. Let's close for a word of, bow for a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you um, for the gift of your word. I want to thank you for the gift of, uh, of a church family that we not only talk about love, but we take the opportunity to express it. We couldn't do it without the gift of your son. Your Bible is clear that all of us have gone our own way, that we have our own um, inclinations, that we have our own desires, that because of sin, they were far away from you. Forgive me, forgive us when we don't appreciate the amazing gift of love you gave us.